Our last uh, session this afternoon is touching on sort of a broader issue of rural telecommunications and digital infrastructure and I guess we'd probably talk about it more in terms of um, digital agriculture and where it's going to take us. Um, I was recently uh, lucky enough to do a bit of a travel through the Corn Belt in the US and it really uh, surprised me the extent to which uh, crop producers there are now utilising uh, a whole range of different digital platforms um, which contain everything from uh, weather and climate information through to the last 10 years of uh, yield maps through to their variable rate recipe for the next crop they're going to plant. Um, that integration uh, and collection of digital information around agriculture is, uh, is changing very quickly um, and is certainly, uh, I think, going to be the next area where there are some productivity gains to be made if we can get it all right. Um, so our two speakers um, this afternoon for our last session, um, I, I perhaps uh, label the dream and the reality. I'm not sure which is which. Um, I'd better be careful if, uh, if uh, Sue McCluskey hears me referring to her, not in terms of the dream but in terms of the reality. But anyway, um, <laughs> the first speaker is uh, Professor David Lamb, whom many of you will have uh, heard of. He's the, uh, the head of the um, Smart Farm Project at the University of New England. So Dave is a physicist who's worked in the area of precision agriculture for 20 years. He was part of the original team which introduced precision viticulture to Australia in the late 1990s and has worked in the area since the very first forays into yield mapping technology, airborne uh, video and electromagnetic, source, electromagnetic soil surveys on farms occurred at that time. He established the University of New England's Precision Agriculture Research Group in 2002 a multidisciplinary team of 15 academics, research and technical staff working on precision agriculture sensors and applications across rain-fed and irrigated cropping, livestock and horticulture. Um, he leads the University Smart Farm Project, a 2,900 hectare sheep farm showcasing contemporary and future precision agriculture and intel intelligence gathering technology. So please welcome uh, for the first speaker this afternoon, uh, Professor David Lamb. Thanks, Mike. Uh, g'day. I uh, thank you all kindly for an opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm not into policy, uh, and you probably worked out last night I'm not into suits either, but I'm, I'm obviously on a steep learning curve. I wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of smart farms, and the, and the word smart actually stands for something. It's about sustainable, manageable, and accessible rural technologies on farm. So in some respects, Mike's quite right. Um, I am a bit of a dreamer. But in dreaming, we're coming up with the stark reality of, of uh, what we can and can't do uh, in this country moving forward. Um, so really, they're the dreamers, the doers, and the dollars uh, in, any, in, any, in any arrangement. Now, we, we already know farms are obviously synonymous with food, fibre, and even fuel production. But there's actually a fourth commodity, something that can be bought and sold on farms, and that is data and information. So the notion of digital agriculture Big data uh, is getting a lot of press at the moment, uh, but I come from an angle of, well, from little data, big data grows. So everything has a source and a sink. So when you consider the technologies that are emerging on farms as we speak and are uh, on the near horizon, you know, the ability to, 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 to monitor livestock, uh, soil moisture probes, the ubiquitous yield monitors on harvesters, soil surveying technology, you know, GPS, registered crowdsourcing information from phones, airborne and satellite surveying technologies, and even the usual manual measurements of things that matter on farm. All these can be captured and recorded. So, you know, we have a totally different way of looking at our farmscapes now. It's data and intelligence. And with that, of course, comes the, the thorny issue of connectedness. What I want to do is to give you a really quick surf through some of the opportunities of connectedness. So, in a way, I, I want you to see the dream and also the reality of, of what's going on in technology development on farms. 
I am not going to cover horticulture. I'm not going to cover aquaculture. I'm not even going to cover the, very heavily the, the grains industry, for example. I want to give you a microcosm by looking at, for example, through the lens of our own farm in the New England Tablelands, which for those of you that aren't familiar with the New England, uh, lies between Sydney and Brisbane and is about an hour inland up on the northern Tablelands. What are the opportunities for connectedness? Well, since I started in what we call precision agriculture, which was GPS-enabled agriculture some 20 years ago, um, you know, we were dealing with, with a lot of technology on offer to farmers, production systems, that was, that was a lot of promise and very little in delivery. Satellite imaging was a classic case. You know, we spent 15 years trying to undo the mistakes of the past and the promises and, the, and, the, and if you like, the bad blood that was created by offering technologies onto a marketplace that simply weren't capable of delivering what people were expecting. But nowadays, satellite imagery, for example, has come a long way. You know, it's, we obviously have the, the mainstays like our motor satellite, our twice daily overpass satellites, but we now have new Landsat products with 18-day with overpasses. We've got Worldview 3. So we've got access to, to unprecedented resolution in our imagery, and that sort of information is, is, is now being made accessible to growers for things like crop forecasting. The sugar industry is an exemplar of that. Um, every, every sugar crop grown in the country um, has a yield forecast um, taped to it, which is then used by the mills to, to forecast their processing requirements and, uh, and, and, and plan the logistics. And of course, you take platforms like Google Earth, which is now becoming um, very widely used in terms of rendering and disseminating data and information to people uh, through, through very simple web access type platforms, assuming of course you have access to the internet. And of course, it's all about then bringing that information back into the farm for use. Um, to support scouting tools and day-to-day -day management tools. And of course, you need to be able to connect to the internet from somewhere else on the farm that's not necessarily the homestead in order to do that. In the livestock industry, you know, we have got these tools that are out there that are on offer. We have Pastures for Space, for an example, which is a product developed by CSIRO and, and WA Landgate. That's now gone through a second iteration of development, and so we're now seeing rangelands ready, North Australia ready products. Here's an example of, of a tool that, uh, that provides a weekly pasture forecast for, the, for a property in the Western Kimberley, which is also connected to the MLA stocking rate calculator. So not only do you get to observe your, your biomass on offer, and it can be calibrated for those difficult countrysides where you've got lots of land systems, it takes time, but it can be done. But, um, but you can also look at trajectories by comparing with the archive of imagery dating back for 12, 15 years, um, identify the year that you're tracking with, and then effectively do stocking rate calculations using the MLA type plug and play calculator. And, and those sort of platforms are now available um, on the internet and of course are now being brought out in app form for, for, for digester on the ground. Um, you, you've got to bear in mind that, um, that uh, there's, there's new kit on the block. I mean, consider the fact that uh, we're staring down the barrel of the ability, as I have in my hand here, to track every animal within our farms, so I'm not talking about the National Livestock Identification Scheme, which allows us to track animals on and off farm through, through side yards to point of slaughter, but devices that can actually track animals around while they are on the farm. Uh, and so if we've got 28 million animals walking around, that's going to generate an enormous amount of information. And if you look here, for example, people are only now starting to think about what this can be used for. This is a, a, a mob of sheep. Um, that are eff effectively being tracked around this particular field over the space of a couple of days. They're camping there at night. They move out into the gullies to graze. Behind that is a colour map of the soil P level, the soil phosphorus level. Where the animals are grazing, they're removing the phosphorus. It's suboptimal in terms of soil P. It needs, it needs a good feed. And of course, they're distributing that nutrient back up on the hills where they're camping. Now, that sort of information is, could be the basis of a fertiliser prescription map for that field, for example. So this is not grains industry precision ag, this is potential livestock industry precision ag, an industry that is only now just waking up to the potential of this technology. This, in fact, is a yield map for a, a mob of sheep. If you consider that the history of precision ag and spatially enabled agriculture started the day we could put GPSs on board harvesters and measure every second the instantaneous uh, weight of grain being stripped from the crop, and then we could use that to create a yield map. 
that got the whole grains industry asking questions about uh, inputs, uh, judicious application of inputs, um, bottom line questions about where, which part of the paddock subsidising the other and so forth, and obviously targeting yield goals more, more effectively. So we're moving from a six metre cutting front now to a six centimetre cutting front, because if you can track your animals, uh, then why not look at where they're grazing and how much time they're spent grazing, and if you can, as, as you can do, and there's research around the world and including in Australia that demonstrates that if you uh, monitor where they're tracking at specific windows of the day, then you can effectively watch them consume the, the feed base. And, um, and with the walkover waste system that records their weight every time they take water, you can create what I have here, which is an annualised map of weight gain for our sheep um, over that field. So just like a grain yield map, you're looking at at least an order of magnitude between those parts of the field that are produce, providing high yield and those parts of the field that are, that are producing relatively low yield. So when the livestock industry gets access to this technology, which is only a matter of time, then we're going to have another part of our, another 18 per cent of our industry waking up to, well, I need data and I need it now and I need lots of it. So um, we've learned a lot of lessons from the grains industry and we're about to set foot into the livestock sector. So we need to be ready for them. If you can track animals around, then of course you can start looking at fingerprints of behaviour. This is an example of a statistical fingerprint highlighted by the red. Um, this is associated with a wild dog attack on a mob of sheep. <coughs> we didn't design that in the experiment. We certainly had no animal ethics approval to set a pack of wild dogs on our sheep, but it happened. And uh, so we've got a neat fingerprint at the same time. So moving dots on a map becomes a, a, a critical alert, which could then drive something like a text alarm when something's happening. The photo in there, in the middle there, is, a, is, a, uh, is an image of a, of a wild dog that's been fingerprinted using um, feature recognition software. So this is the sort of research that the, the Minister for Agriculture recently funded through the Invasive Animals CRC. Smart sentinel systems on farm. There's a dog, my trail cam, if you like, has captured a photo of it. Does it fit the physical profile of a wild dog? Have I seen that dog here before? Yes, yes, it's obviously not a possum, it's not a protected species. Send out an alert, or as some people are developing, um, take some form of action in terms of a smart dart. Um, now, I should add that when it comes to smart darts, it's not about um, um, zapping it on the spot. It may, it's more about putting it to sleep till you can check it next morning to make sure it is something that should be put to sleep and then deal with it. But you need to be able to access that technology to use it. I'm doing my best to stay politically correct. If you can track dots around on a map, then can you do something about them? And virtual fencing, I think, has always been one of those sort of holy grail imagination capturing technologies out there. We don't have virtual fences in this country, but we do have people in this country and indeed worldwide working on it. So if you can track a dot on a map, can you make it do something? Well, here is an example of a virtual fence. <coughs> Those white pegs in the ground um, are, a, are a line, are an invisible line that when the cattle cross, they get a little bell go off in their ear and it's on the collar. If they go another three metres beyond that line, they'll get a little zap. Um, in other words, if they ignore the bell, they get a zap. Now, these are naive cattle, have never been exposed to this before. <coughs> my favourite demo, but always my time. Can we go back, sorry? Just hit the backspace. Having built it up, I'd like to play it. I could. Here we go. Okay. Bell goes off. Couldn't give a hoot. Zap! Same animal about an hour and a half later. Bell goes off. Ooh, didn't pay attention. <laughs> Same animal <laughs> about two hours later. <laughs> Watch its ears. Heard the bell. Acted. I mean, animals are smart. But interestingly enough, having conducted that trial for a period of six months, you know, you learn more, there are more questions about how the animals behave with this technology than about the ability of the technology to work. For example, there's a rock about three metres past that post that those animals associated with that stimulus. So do you think we could move those cattle up into that granite hill behind them? Not a hope in hell. In other words, there's technology opportunities, but there are some realities about it. Now, 
this is about telecommunications realities, right? But I guess what I'm saying is, is, is that there is some form of future around virtual containment. We know that we've got pet containment systems. It may come to play in agriculture, but of course we need to be able to connect every part of our farms in order to be able to do that. Because those collars work on a position measurement, and that position measurement is compared to that virtual line in the sand. On the right, we have a drone that's flying simple transects over a pasture plot, collecting and measuring the pasture biomass on the go. On the left here, we have a fully robotic tractor that's run with no one inside it and guided by a satellite augmented positioning system. There is no mobile phone connection to it, no uh, network calls, signal being trans transferred to it over the mobile network and there is only a single receiver on the tractor that's receiving both the GPS signal and the correction signal. So the future of robotics, as was correctly identified in that preamble, is, is here and, um, and is not far away. But the license to operate this sort of technology is going to rely on, on the safeguards, the data connectivity and the, and the, um, and the fail safes that we build into it. Um, just to give you an example to flesh out the drone example, that's a thousand dollar DJI Phantom that I bought on the internet with a credit card, a work credit card, but I did get approval. In the space of four minutes, I was able to fly and collect those photos that you can see in that, uh, in that global view of a little patch of land and then apply a, what we call a, a, a digital photogrammetric technique which used to take hours on big machines to do and I did that on my phone, connected to the cloud live. And in doing so, I was able to create a three-dimensional model of that segment of the farm, which was, uh, allowed me then to go and do things like measure the dimensions of my trees. We're interested in carbon. If you can measure the dimensions of your tree, you can estimate the diameter at breast height. If you can do that, you can estimate carbon. And um, these are the sorts of capabilities that anyone can get when they buy these drones using free-to-air apps. So, uh, there is an enormous amount of science at everyone's fingertips, not just scientists' fingertips. Smartphones, that is a small handheld optical device for estimating the biomass of pastures. On the left is a smartphone which has an onboard calibrator. It crowdsources the calibration process that the farmer uses to build smarter algorithms and then sends it back through the phone to the farmer to use. Now, <coughs> Mike confessed to me that, that uh, while he sits through these interminable presentations, he actually has a dream. And that's about getting a sensor that you can stick out the side of your car and drive through the paddock. You can do it, Mike. You can do it. If you can get your phone to work to update your calibration for that particular site, for that, for that particular species, for that particular uh, time of year. So it can be done if we're connected. So your dreams are reality. I can say that. Tracking quad bikes. You know, where are my quad bikes? Who's using it and how fast are they going? Again, it's about being connected to, to the quad bike. So what are the key ingredients of this sort of snapshot? technology. Well, the first one, and I'd like to build on the presentation from last night where we talked about key infrastructure, you know, transportation networks and ports and, and energy. Well, I'd like to start at number three and move on. There's another key infrastructure, critical infrastructure, which is our telecommunications. We need to get our farmers connected and it's more than just connecting along major travel corridors. And the reality of the mobile black spot program and others is that this is about provider black spots. If you look at that map down there, that little portion of South Australia, you know, there's 300% coverage in certain areas, which rapidly goes down to 100% and then zero. So are we really targeting black spots as, uh, in terms of what farmers need? Of course, with the uh, long-term satellite system up and running now, or about to go up and running, we've got our 101 cell locations on the country, if you can call them that. And, um, and we love to fill those cells with lots of chattering devices on farms. Absolutely love to. Um, but already there are concerns about, for example, the hinterland regions where there may be enormous traffic because of the concentration of small blocks or creating data. So there already is, uh, is talk around deloading some cells and, and, and coming up with clever ways of managing load because the internet of things on farm could potentially just swamp the, the, the network if, if we got our, our way. And behind that are the business model challenges. You know, if we're giving everyone access to high-speed internet, we're giving them all a, a V8 supercar, but we could be charging them a fortune at the browser to run it. Data packages, will they suit the way farmers want to utilise and access and move around data and information? And the old video chat is a classic. You can use up your 
monthly plan, a very big monthly plan, um, in, two and a, in nearly three hours worth of video chat. And that's a couple of consults with the GP or, or, or a face-to-face -face chat to your uh, agronomic advisor. And what about if you want to distribute things around the farm? You know, every connect point to, say, NBN or mobile is a data package. So if you want um, bore sensors or if you want a camera on a water crossing that could be an hour and a half's drive away from your farmhouse, there are multiple data packages that you have to deal with. And of course, there's the whole compatibility issue. What's it going to take for things to talk, for example, to the NBN or to the mobile network? And there's a lot of opportunities for the smart services sector to work in that space. And the other piece of critical infrastructure is, a, is what I would call a national positioning infrastructure. We have a national network of continuously operating reference stations to provide GPS correction signals to give us our centimetre positioning accuracy. We have that, but the way the industry has worked with positioning technology is, it, is that there is a, a proliferation of privately owned base stations around the country. And, um, and there is some behaviour which I would hazard to suggest is, is, is monopoly rental behaviour. I mean, there are some areas, for example, in the sugar industry that have got three different RTK positioning networks in the same catchment, yet it's still costing growers a fortune, $1,000, up to $1,000 a year per receiver to work. I heard the other day that 60% of the sugar industry is ready, is, is physically capable with, with machinery and implements that they've got to utilise RTK positioning systems and only 20% are using it because of things like this, the way the market's shaken out. So maybe a, uh, a future where every farm doesn't have their own private network or be become part of a group that has a network that they have to then assume the risk of maintaining and operating, that may be better replaced by some national positioning infrastructure. Um, for example, using precise point positioning where you basically have a satellite model, uh, sorry, a, a global model of the atmosphere, which allows you to, to determine your correction signal at any given location, and then you, are, you receive a user-specific correction signal that can be transmitted to you by satellite. And that earlier example of the robotic tractor is just that. So I would suggest that that may be another piece of critical infrastructure we need. If you look at the bottom right-hand side, there are two wheel tracks. One wheel track was provided by the conventional on-ground RTK system, and the real track on the right was provided by the satellite-only delivered signal. They are compatible. So I guess um, just to uh, do, do justice to the title of the talk, I, I, I want to mention that we got the message that the best way to give the message is to show the message. In other words, if we want to show people the value of connected farms, then we need to start assembling exemplars of connected farms and showing other farmers just what you can gain from it. And our smart farm is an example. It's about 7,000 acres. It's a sheep operation. And we've got it covered. We've, we're blessed with good mobile connectivity. We've got the Rnet fibre and the NBN fibre. We've got NBN satellite and we've got fixed wireless NBN. Now, no other farm will have that. No other farm needs that. But, of course, we can then demonstrate any connection scenario that may be on offing. So it's the hub of an of a international R&D network. Why? Because it's connected. And, and we shouldn't be the only ones doing that. It's got a smart farm innovation centre so people can come in and see the technology, feel it, and then look at it in, in, in a uh, digital sense. So I guess to reinforce my point, uh, 10 o'clock, just before sn smoke, I snuck out. I had to change a few slides. Al, it was worth it. And I thought, well, blow me down. What's going on on my farm? So, so OK. So there were no pigs in the trap. That's a good thing, because I wasn't there to pop them anyway. Um, that's handy to know. The quad bike was back in the shed. Now, this is real data. The quad bike was back in the shed where it belongs. OK, so it had been taken out for a run back in the shed. But I'm going to give my young fella a bollocking when I get home tonight because he exceeded 35 k's an hour on the road going home. <laughs> <coughs> the bulls are in the paddock where I left them. They're running on the same tracking system here and they're still in the paddock where I left them. The rain had arrived. You beauty, even though it means a bus ride home tonight, and it's working because the soil moisture is kicking up beautifully in that particular paddock. I got the fertiliser out last week. Uh, I can see it in the weekly satellite growth rate imagery, and more importantly, I can see uh, down here on the right-hand side that the past has kicked off nicely, um, thanks to the last two and a half weeks of intermittent rain. And you can even see the effect of the hot spells we had where was our past is simply stalled. So it's now time to plan and think about the rotations. So in other words, I'm happy to be here because I'm not missing a huge amount of things at home. 
Now, can any one of the other 136,999 farms say the same? And it's not because we've got great tech, how good are we? It's we're just connected. And m a lot of farms are connected. So what about those that aren't? And maybe they should be. So I guess if you'd like to keep abreast of these sort of technologies, please stay in touch, if you can. Thank you. <coughs>